Welcome to the 2012 eGovernance Workshop, Leveraging Social Media. What we're going to talk about is how your organization can leverage social media to engage stakeholders and build community capital. Now, the first thing we need to understand is what is social media. And social media is really those, those applications that, you know, normally you think of our kids using, but typically it's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's a, a lot of blogging, and a lot of folks don't think of it as social media, but it also includes YouTube. So let's get into those people. And first I want to tell you why social media is important. Social media, like any other media that you use to communicate, you really need to understand who's looking at it, who your target audience is, and how they're accessing it. So you can target your message using the right types of social media. So what we're going to do is use a study by Janice here, and here's her information. You can see it on the screen. Uh, she's the CEO of Alpha Brand Media. I didn't come up with these numbers. These are all her numbers. But we're going to use that from the Search Engine Journal to look at what parts of social media, how it's growing, and who's using what stuff. So first of all, let's look at this user's timeline. And this is a great graph. I love this because, first of all, it shows you by age category who's using what part of social media. And what's amazing is, well, we all know that the 18 by 29 year olds are taking the most advantage of it. And you can see that over the past few years, their growth leads all the other age groups. But what's super exciting is the two groups, which include the, um, the 30 to 49 year old group and the 50 to 64 year old group, so really that 30 to 64 year old group is growing the fastest. And when you think about it, in just the last year, they've had the biggest jump, especially in that 50 to 64-year-old group. I like to think of that as, you know, Facebook started as people talking about themselves, mostly young people, and then it kind of took over where parents were talking about their children, and then the grandparents are having to log in to check out about the children. But you'll notice that that biggest increase in uh, growth between last year and this year really took place in the 30 to 64-year-old group why is that important? Because those are your stakeholders. Those are the people we really need to focus on. Let's also take a look at what people are using in social media. And this graph is also excellent because you can see that dominating social media is really Facebook. They've got 63% of the overall social media and this is membership share. So this is a little scary because it's actually people who have accounts and use the system. So let's look at this for a little bit more. You can see the top one is Facebook by a large group. What's really interesting for me is, even though Facebook kind of dominates, YouTube is number two at 20.5%. What's really interesting about that is most people who use YouTube don't have an account or don't log in. So they're accessing it. This is just incredible. One in four Americans access YouTube every day. And let's look at LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn's important because this is really great for a recruiting tool. Now, a lot of times you can't, you wouldn't use it as your go-to place for engaging stakeholders, but it's a great source for you to use to do, especially to look at engaging people who are involved in what you're doing. So if you want to connect, let's say you're a superintendent or you're a CFO of a city or your city manager, you could link up with people who are doing what you're doing and build discussion groups to talk about those things. It's kind of a Facebook for professionals. What they've really done recently is they've made it so that it's a great resource for folks who want to do recruiting. So if you're looking for a specific person in a specific industry to do a specific thing, LinkedIn is a great way to do that. Next thing I want to look about is Facebook growth, 2010 to 2011. Uh, and I love these three areas. So users accessing via their mobile device, 200% growth in one year. Uh, pieces of content shared weekly, and this is incredible. We went from 3.5 billion pieces of information shared weekly in 2010. In 2011, 7 billion pieces of information. That could be a photo, a little thing that you're posting out there. That is a lot of information, huge growth. And the registered users here have gone from 350% to 640%. That's an 80 2% growth in just one year. So Facebook is really growing quickly. So a lot of times private organizations, cities, towns, and boards of education, are, people will come to you and say, look at what private industry is doing. You know? And a lot of times it doesn't 
kind of mesh up or it doesn't translate into the public sector. But I think in this case, it sort of does. And so why don't we look and see what some companies are using in social media. You see that the percent of companies who are using social media, who are using Facebook, 71%, 59% are using Twitter, 50% are blogging, YouTube, 33%, and then it drops down. I love seeing um, MySpace on these charts because they dominated now 6%. Then you can see the percentage of folks who are using blogs has gone up also. 2007, just 16%, 2012, 43%. So if local companies are doing it, then you want to know why, why wouldn't it work for schools? Now, a lot of times what we hear in schools and cities and counties, and especially schools, is that we're going to ban all social media from the site because it's bad. And you keep hearing all these reasons why it's bad. And what we'll do is scroll through just a few newspaper reports that have come out of problems that other folks have had. But what we need to understand is while we can talk about social media within your organization, what I want you to focus on is how to use social media to engage with people outside of your organization. And that's really where we want to break up that uh, distinction. So let's look at a couple of these stories. Teachers warned over briefing, uh, befriending pupils on Facebook. And this is true. There's a big uh, problem with uh, folks maybe getting involved with social networking. And what we've done is we've actually put together a series of uh, policies that you can look at if you're a school where you can base your, your social media on. The problem here is most students, when they get into the uh, real world and they get a job, they're going to need to know how to communicate with superiors and be able to, to talk to their peers using social media. So totally cutting this off could be a problem. Also, schools should exercise caution on social media. This was from Daytona Beach, Florida, where social media uh, you know, talks about being positive. Um, but they're talking about chat programs can actually increase and engage staff uh, members when they're talking to uh, talking to their students. I know that we've talked about um, students who are currently using these types of communications to actually help each other in school. So this is a great time where you could actually engage students and tell them what's the proper way to use social media? Why is this stuff there all the time? What's going to happen when you start looking for a job? Here's some senators say requiring passwords could be illegal, and yes it is. Some school districts or some organizations are saying, look, if you use social media when you come to work for us, you have to give us your password and username, and of course you can't do that. So another story here, students create fake online profiles to peers. Another great way where you can get involved with your, uh, with your students and show them that just because they meet somebody online, it often, it, well not often, but sometimes it's not that person. And some students are smart, they actually create multiple profiles online. So I think it's a great way to enhance your personal relationships. If you know that person and personally, it's a great way to uh, connect with them, but not as a standalone service. And here's another one, school ban some schools ban Facebook accounts altogether. Uh, and this is tricky because, you know, you can talk, you can define what people uh, can do with Facebook, but you can't ban your employees and your students from using it altogether. Uh, some folks are locking down their networks, but, you know, you can carry a little device and a student can carry a little uh, hotspot, turn it on and give 10 people access to the system, to the network and totally bypass your whole network. So there, here's a video on YouTube that uh, goes to illustrate one of the problems that some students see or that some administrators see. In this particular um, instance, what we have is some state legislatures that tried to ban Facebook, uh, uh, tried to ban social media in their district. Welcome to 12th grade journalism class, Amanda. I'll be your teacher, Mr. Legislator. Good morning, Mr. Legislator. I made a Facebook page for our student paper. Want me to show it to you? Are you some kind of degenerate criminal? What? Do you want to be cyberbullied? No, you don't understand. It's a page where our students can keep up with our latest work right where they're spending time online anyway. I can just show you and you'll see. I will see that you're breaking the law by accessing a social networking site in school. And then I will see that you get detention, or flogged in the public square, or something. Flogged. In the public. Square? 
Since when do we have? That's not the point, insolent child. Everyone knows social networking sites are populated primarily by cyber bullies. Really? Because some real bullies are beating up the arts editor right now in the hallway. With Facebook? No, with fists. And I think one of them has some kind of flamethrower. Oh, good. As long as it's not with social networking. Because that's worse. Worse? Than a freaking flamethrower. Much. Facebook is much more dangerous than fire. You can put out a fire but you can't put out a Facebook page. Anyway that's not the point. We also banned social networking because it's a distraction. So you are going to teach us journalism skills for real life in a way that doesn't use any social networking. Why is that so hard? It's not like there is news or information on sites like Facebook and Twitter. Are you kidding? Where do you think old media gets information these days? Haven't you ever heard of crowdsourcing? I love crowd surfing. No. Not crowdsourcing, like asking people on social media about newsworthy topics to uncover trends or find inside information. Inside information about cyberbullying? No. Inside information about news stories. Since social networking connects media to both its sources and its audience more directly it improves the quality of journalism exponentially. I don't understand why you can't get with the program, Amanda this is for your own good. I know what's best for you. Really? Stopping me from using the tools other journalists use every day is what's best for me because cyberbullying is worse than a flamethrower. So we were just going to make a print paper? Print. That's what that upstart Thomas Paine used to attack King George. It was paper bullying. So what then? Pick up a stone tablet and get to work. I hate Rhode Island. Okay, so let's talk about how you can best utilize social media. And we talk about getting on the uh, social media bandwagon. Now what social media does and a lot of things in network in computers do is they build these kind of peer-to-peer -peer network connections. So folks can really communicate, not kind of in a hub and spoke environment, but among each other. And what you want to be able to do is you want to figure out a way to stand out in that ecosystem. How can you be, build a presence in social media where your stakeholders will find you and see that data? Well, we talked about, first of all, it's important for you to find out who those big players are and really focus on who they are. Well, let's see who those big players are. Just like we saw earlier, the big players are the folks where your stakeholders are every day. And it's important to note that this changes every year. So today, the big players are Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And one of the things you can do when you're posting on Twitter is make it so that it automatically shows up on your Facebook account. Hard to do that the other way because Facebook allows you to post these very large messages. Twitter, they're typically shorter. The second thing you can do is socialize all your online content. We're going to see an example of this in a little bit, but your existing content is a rich source of data that people can get to. The first thing you want to do is put a Facebook like on every page. Now to do that, you actually have to have a, a presence on Facebook. Uh, same thing with Twitter follow. If you have a Twitter account for your organizations, it's important that on your website, you make it easy for people to follow you on Twitter. This next step though, you don't need to have a Twitter or Facebook account yourself to do. And this is simply taking all the content that you have on your website and putting a little direct link on there that allows people to take that content and post it or post a link to it on their account. So for instance, if you are building a new school building and you have posted the drawings on your website, you could literally have it so that you can have people share that on Facebook so that they, wow, I saw this new building, it's great, click here to take a look at it. That allows your content to go, go viral. Embed YouTube video content to better tell your story, and this is huge. What you can do is build a video library, and I would say do this now. Go ahead and get a YouTube account if you don't have one. The earlier you do, the better. And start putting, your inf start putting video information in there. You want to make sure that you own the content and that you don't use any background music that is copyright related. But once you put that information there, you start building a YouTube channel 
Don't just leave it there. Actually embed that into your website. And I would use YouTube to publish your board meetings and community forums. Any of those public meetings that you're currently having, you don't have to get releases. Those are public meetings right now. You can start recording them, pushing that on YouTube right away. The next thing you want to do is drive users to your home page. So I like this and you can work with Google to return all the results to your main home page and actually that way you can have the messaging set up in one place. A lot of times Google will search and take down into those content pages and it's harder to manage the content and what folks see there. I would visit your stakeholders. If you're a school, visit your PTA at the beginning of each year, show them the content that you have on your site and ask them to like the district's Facebook and to follow you on Twitter. Super important that they find your presence on, uh, out there in the ecosystem. And then post links on Twitter and Facebook back to specific content on your, um, on your organization's webpage. So for instance, if you're having a council meeting or a board meeting, you would want to post that meeting and make that aware to everybody right in your social ecosystem. And when they click on it, it brings everyone back to your website so they can access that information. Get a YouTube channel now. This is important. Uh, it's free. The sooner you create it, the sooner you start posting information, the sooner YouTube will start releasing the data and give you uh, um, more content space. When you initially set up the site, they're changing this, they'll give you a limit between 20 and 30 minutes for posting information. It used to be 15. They're bumping that up. The sooner you prove to them that you're not ripping off someone else's content and posting it out there, the sooner they'll extend that and virtually give you unlimited content that you can post there. Watch out if you're a school and you post student information, especially if they can identify those students and it's not a public performance. Um, it's really important that if you're featuring students that you get a release on every single video you shoot, the blanket release at the beginning of the school year is not good. If students are creating original content like videos, make sure that they sign a release to allow you to post that. When people create original material, say a movie or a short, they own that content and you can't post it unless you get a release for them. And make sure you do that every time you post something. Um, the second thing is I would post and share those community forums. And those are already in the public space. The one thing I would warn you is if somebody's coming and making a presentation, let's say the band um, performed somewhere and they're showing a clip from the music that they played, that music is copyrighted. You need to make sure that you've got a release that you can actually use that performance on a video, many cases a license where you bought the music to play it, say a marching band, would include a performance at your game, but not posting it online. So make sure you have that information ahead of time. Uh, also embed that exceptional content in your website. So if you've got something great that you've put on there, we talked about that, put it there. That drives people who look at your video content back to your website. And every time you post something fresh, link it to YouTube and Twitter. Look, we've got this new, um, new bit of information out there. Anytime you do anything on the web, it's important that you keep your content fresh and dynamic. So all your web content should be up to date. If you have some stuff out there that's outdated, get rid of it. Same thing with up, uh, Twitter and Facebook. You really want to try and post something every single weekday. There's some piece of news or something interesting that'll keep people engaged. Um, we like to say that you use content, use board docs to post the content of your board meetings to your district website. It's a super easy to do. You can take a YouTube video, link it to your meeting so you've got video. And then if anything special happens, you can instantly tweet about it using board docs and link back to those things. If you find errors on your website, make sure you fix them quickly. Same thing with Twitter and Facebook. If you post something and you notice an error, you can fix it right away. So let's look at some examples of folks who have used social media. So here's Austin School District. They've done a really good job posting some information or having information out on their website. Notice down here at the bottom, they have the stay connected areas. This allows you to drive stakeholders to social media on every single page they have. Notice, follow, uh, follow us on social media. And those icons are pretty understandable by folks who are on the web. The first one is Twitter, obviously, Facebook, YouTube, they have a blogging, and they have a news feed. Uh, the news feeds are kind of coming out of vogue, but you still see them from time to time. This is Board Docs, and notice here, every single document in Board Docs, once you turn on social sharing, anyone who accesses the page can tweet, 
Facebook, or email a link to this. And this allows you, once again, to take that data, and that data, that real data, becomes the um, content or any dis uh, for any discussion that haps, happens out in this uh, ecosystem. So some really nice things can go even go viral. So this is a great example of having those links in on every page. Customize your Twitter and Facebook site so they look like the rest of your uh, uh, online materials. I think it's great to have all your branding look the same. It gives a consistent look and feel, and folks know they're accessing your organization's information. So Austin, once again, has done a really good job doing this. This is actually their Facebook site, and you can see that it's branded. And once we go down into it, you can see their logo. You know exactly who they are and what they're doing. Now, here's a great example of using YouTube video within an organization to share meeting information. This is with Board Docs, but notice right there you see the meeting with the documents, with the agenda, with all the background information, and we're, we're embedding that YouTube video within the system. They don't have to go look at the meeting agenda in one place, the minutes in another place, and the video in a third place. It's all consolidated in one area, and that's a great thing about social media and most of these Web 2.0 applications. You can integrate them all into one place. Bordax makes that very easy for you. Likewise, if you want, you can drive that information back. So if you want in more information on uh, social media, uh, here's my email address on our website. You can actually go to our website. I'm going to show you quickly. Um, you can go to our website. And you can download not only this presentation, but we have some policies that uh, you can look at too. So let's switch over to that really quickly. Here's our website. And basically all you have to do is click on support. And you'll notice down here is a little button that says it's time to go viral. Simply click there and you'll see where you can get information uh, on the presentation I just made. You can actually watch it. You can share that with Twitter and Facebook. You can see the links we have right there. And down below, um, Dick Clapp of Neola, they do policy consulting for about a thousand school districts nationwide. They, he's given us some sample policies that you guys can use to review uh, and implement if you're a school district that have to do with social media. So feel free to contact us. Thank you for attending the eGovernance workshop. And if you couldn't, thank you for watching the video so you can catch up remotely. Hope to see you next year.